There's so many ways, whether it's financing, whether it's getting assistance from your family, or even just switching that mindset. You know, I could buy a car or I could buy a business. Welcome to the Franchise Hot Seat Podcast, where we talk about all things franchising. Now, here's your host, Dr. John P. Hayes. Welcome to our Franchise Hot Seats Podcast. My guest today, Kayla Ryan, Nashville, Tennessee, or the Nashville, Tennessee area, Kayla. So you are, this got to put a lot of pressure on you. You are the daughter of a franchise legend, good friend of mine, member of the Titus Center Advisory Board, uh, Thomas Scott, who I've known a long time, uh, love talking to him about franchising and all of his family. He gets all of his family involved. Does that put pressure on you being the daughter of? (laughs) Maybe a little bit. I mean, you know, he's incredible, influential. He's probably taught me everything I know and more, you know, little pressure, definitely to live up to the name for sure. (laughs) Yeah, great. So you got involved in franchising in high school and maybe you felt you didn't have any choice with a father so involved in franchising and your mother also runs a franchise. So what was that like as a young person in high school and you knew, well, I probably have a future in franchising. Yeah, you know, I was probably about 14 or 15 when I got into franchising. And it's so stereotypical to like follow the parent's step. But in all honesty, I was probably completely honest. Uh, I wanted to do something totally different. I wanted to be a teacher and I, you know, went and sat in on a college course, a psychology course. And I was like, oh, maybe I want to be a psychologist. And then all of a sudden I was like, I after sitting in the one course, I was like, no, I want to run a bunch of businesses. I want to own an empire. And I was like, great. I'm just like my parents, but no, it, it's been great. I've loved the journey, you know, working in the management side versus the marketing side versus operations. It's I'm 24 now, but I feel like I've been doing it since I was literally a 10, but it's been great. And I I love franchising and I wish more and more Gen Z's, millennials, I think I'm a cusper. I don't even exactly know exactly what I am, but I wish more people my age were involved in it. And I would challenge them to get involved in it more. And in all honesty, I think we're seeing an entrepreneurial shift, not only in franchising, but just in business ownership in general, that is going to push more. And so push more younger people our age to be entrepreneurs and franchisees and, you know, maybe even franchisors. <clears throat> well, my program at the Titus Center, uh, where we have a, a concentration in franchising at Palm Beach Atlantic University, we're only in our sixth year. Uh, we have more than 60 students now earning a concentration in franchising. We started out with no students. Uh, it was a brand new program uh, endowed by a franchisor and a franchise company, United Franchise Group. So I've seen, I've witnessed the growth among young people who come to college to study maybe business, maybe marketing, maybe psychology, maybe nursing, uh, pharmacy. We have a pharmacy school. I hear from all those folks eventually. You know, I'll hear from people who say, well, I never thought about franchising. Didn't know it really existed. Didn't know how it would apply to me. But then they earned the concentration in franchising. It gives them a lot of leverage on whatever degree they get, whether it's a finance or accounting management degree, especially marketing. So many people, young people, can get involved in in franchise marketing, either for a specific brand or working with a supplier or working for a multi operate, multi unit operator franchisee. So, did, in high school, did it occur to you, why don't I just buy a franchise? My father represents a lot of them. Now owns several of them. Did it ever occur to you to become a franchisee? Yes. You know, I, I think it definitely did occur to me to become a franchisee. I was looking at some of like the, the charcuterie boards and then I love pets. So um, some of the pet kind of, there was a food, pet food one that I was also interested in. But when I was younger, I actually worked in a marketing agency. It was a franchise development marketing agency called Brand Journalist, which is actually Thomas's literally lived under his name forever. But that I think is what convinced me to be more on the corporate side because I fell in love with not only franchise development marketing, but consumer marketing at the same time, which if you're a marketing executive, you're kind of like, whoa, that's a lot, especially if you hold both of those roles. But it really comes from two different passions of not only wanting to help franchisees, but help people, this is going to sound exactly like Thomas, but help people in general, you know, put themselves out there on the market to their full potential. And 
that's what franchising is all about. So yes, I could have seen myself as a franchisee, but I think I saw myself more on the franchisor side just because I, I love, I'm also hard headed. So me as a franchisee might be kind of difficult, but, um, yeah. I love the wall. So, so the, the big obstacle in this progression for young people is that they don't have the money to become a franchisee. And right. of course, most people think, well, I need a million dollars to buy a franchise. And of course, we know you don't need a million dollars. You don't need a half million dollars. You don't need a quarter of a million dollars in many cases. There are fran many franchises well under $50,000. But even at that, coming out of college, coming out of high school, you don't have $50,000 uh, yeah. to invest. You have no experience. You yeah. haven't worked for anyone. You don't have necessarily a savings. You can't go through the Small Business Administration or to the bank and say, hey, I, I need $60,000 to get into a business. They're likely to say, you need to go do something first to prove yourself. And yet, uh, Thomas has led the, the path to getting young people involved in franchising as franchisees, franchisors, and on the supplier side, particularly working in marketing, you and other members of your family being good examples. Your brother is coming to Palm Beach Atlantic in the fall and is going to study franchising, already has his knife sharpening uh, business, which he might be able to franchise. The challenge is the money. So how do, how do people get over that? You know, I would say there's a few ways. And, you know, you always have your um, your young entrepreneurs, we see that, you know, their parents will invest in them to open a franchise and maybe the student, the kid, you know, the 25 year old will pay them back eventually. So we see a lot of that. We also see it in the mindset of buying a car. You know, a lot of times you can get into a franchise for the same amount as you can buy a car these days. Um, wow. and if you p switch your mindset to like, think of, you know, I could buy a car that's going to depreciate or I could get into a business that's, you know, just going to make me a bunch of money to where I could probably buy a nicer car, then, you know, a lot of people push towards the owning the business. Um, and, you know, we also see those lower cost franchises popping up. Um, you know, I think a few a year or so ago, I, I was Googling what the average cost of a franchise is. And it's exactly what you said. It's 150 to 200,000 more times more than that after the build out costs and everything. But I found my niche in the home service businesses. Um, I bought my house when I was 21 and kind of fell in love with the idea of HGTV and redoing everything. And so, of course, the home service industry, you could actually get in a lot of times for less than 50K or less than the 100K. I mean, I think no. all of the home run franchises that we have are under 70K and our highest one being our up closets business, which is you just have to be a little bit more higher scale entrepreneur to run that one because you have to have a little bit more money down. But yeah, there's so many ways, whether it's financing, whether it's getting assistance from your family or even just switching that mindset. You know, I could buy a car or I could buy a business. Before we continue, let me tell you about the Selling Franchises Boot Camp coming up at Palm Beach Atlantic University, the home of the Titus Center for Franchising in West Palm Beach. This two-day boot camp is jam-packed with information and people who will help you sell more franchises in 2023 and beyond. Everything from lead generation to technology that people are using today to sell more franchises to events that you can incorporate to how to sell to the generations of people who are buying franchises. Baby boomers don't buy the same way as Gen Z buys, and you need to know that information. Plenty of networking opportunities, three major keynotes, lots of information that will be valuable to you in this two-day boot camp at Palm Beach Atlantic University. You can get all the details at TitusCenter.com. Click on Selling Franchises Bootcamp. It's set for January 19 and 20, 2023. That is literally a business in a pizza box, like no. already there for you. Let's go and make some money. So I would say it's, it's a mindset. If you want it, you can have it. And if you would rather go for the car, then get the car. <laughs> so are Gen Zs, do you think they're not well equipped to become franchisees? Do they need to go to work? for someone for a while before they become a, a franchisee, an owner 
of a business um, or is that not the case? You know, I might be bold in saying this, but I think a lot of Gen Zs are more experienced than you think. And it might even be thankful due to COVID. You know, when COVID hit, I was actually in my senior year of college. So COVID hit, I was kicked out of um, school or apartment because it was unsafe, you know, due to the health reasons. So I had to go back home. So I still had half of my senior year left. So finishing school online, but then also it was a mindset of, well, I'm already home. I might as well get a job or, you know, keep working. So finishing school online while also getting a job, you're in the mindset of multitasking. So not only are you learning online, but you're, you're working. So I think Gen Z's as a whole have kind of developed a mindset of where they're used to doing multiple things at once. And that translates even to after they graduate. We see kids graduate in nursing or pharmaceuticals or um, teaching even, and they will do that job, they, but they will also have a business on the side. And that's very normal for my age. Like I think everyone I know who's graduated even with me is they're doing multiple things. My best friend's a nurse, but she also owns a business that does custom mug designs. Um, I know somebody who's an EMT and a paramedic and a firefighter, and he also owns a dryer vent cleaning business. So it's just, I think people don't give Gen Z's enough credit as to how much they actually know or even how much they can figure out on their own. I think the difference in Gen Z and millennials is that Gen Z's aren't going to sit around and wait for you to tell them what to do. They're just going to get to it. Whereas, you know, So what do you recommend to the Gen Z's? If you're talking to a crowd of Gen Z's, what are two or three things that they need to do to learn about franchising, consider franchising, ultimately becoming a business owner? What do you suggest? Um, I would suggest, um, and this is kind of a new thing that I've honestly kind of figured out towards the end of last year and this year is, I would say, I would suggest figuring out your personal brand, figure out who you are, what you enjoy, what you connect with, because ultimately that's going to be the business that you thrive in. Um, I would also say, find your confidence and what your, your strengths and your weaknesses are. If you know you're a killer marketer, but you're a terrible salesperson, figure out what it is in sales that you need to improve on. And then honestly, it all comes down to Google and doing your own research. And even TikTok at this point, watch TikToks, your, your TikTok channel, there's Jack Monson, Social Geek Radio. There's so many people that are willing to reach out and help you as far as learning about franchising. And especially if you're young, I know when I walked into my first IFA event, I felt like a swarm of piranhas surrounded me because I, I look young. So everyone's like, what, who are you? What do you do? Like, how can we help you? And that's really the cool thing about franchising is that it's a cult, to be honest. Everyone's willing to help you and everyone's willing to mentor you and assist you in what you're wanting to do. So I, that would be probably my number one thing is just ask. Ask for a mentor, ask for help, and people are always willing to give it. So people at IFA conventions where you get 4,000, 5,000 franchise professionals see you, come up to you thinking, well, maybe we can sell her a franchise or yeah. maybe she wants to learn about how can we help Kayla, but really you're right. going to flip that around and talk about uh, flick switch marketing where you can help them. Right. How's that work? Yeah. So, you know, growing up in franchising or in just the marketing world in general, thanks to Thomas and all of my family around me, I really started to notice that the traditional way of marketing is really becoming obsolete. And if you think about traditional marketing, it's paid search, your direct mail, um, lead forms, et cetera. That kind of marketing is, if it's more than 50% of your budget, then I would highly suggest you relook at your data and assess your cost per acquisition even because I guarantee you that you're hurting your business right now. And so in noticing that, I started Flick Switch Marketing, which is a conversational marketing agency that focuses on real interactions between customers and real humans to answer questions to direct the customer to turn into a lead, but then also turn into a closed deal. And that, you know, it works not only for consumer, but franchise development as well, because as we're seeing the Gen Z's come in, Gen Z's don't have patience. They don't want to fill out a lead form. They don't want you to call them. They don't want you to send them an email. If they have, an if they have questions, they want their answers right then, right now. Um, actually, they really wanted that answer yesterday. So, 
no. I would say flick switch marketing kind of tied all of that together in a way of we have real human beings answering those questions right then, right there without the customer feeling obligated to give out any personal information or having to wait for a call or wait to fill out a lead form or anything like that. So your clients are both franchisors and franchisees. So I mainly work with franchisees and small business owners with the help of brand journalists. We kind of team up and do the franchise development together just because, you know, I just started my business in June. So, you know, growing, growing slowly, but they're very developed and they have an excellent team there that um, handles a lot of the franchise development um, side of things. But, you know, we obviously assist because it was kind of our, it's our bread and butter. So, so tell me a, a typical scenario of a uh, franchisee who hires you? What, what are they looking for you to do? What are you going to do? How much is it going to cost? What's the end result? Yeah, so when a franchisee comes to me, the first thing I always ask is, you know, what issues are you running into? What issues are you having in your business? Because it, you know, it might not necessarily be a marketing issue. It might just be, you know, something in their operations side or, you know, along, you know, development or ordering, whatever it might be. But a lot of the times it is an issue in their marketing or an issue in the way that they're selling. So when a franchisee comes in, comes to me, I say, we need to look at what you specialize in. So if you are a custom closet business, I always use up closets because it's one of our brands for home run. What needs do you fulfill? So you organize closets, you make your customers happy, you give them a sense of mental health relief because they have an organized space to come home to, wake up to every day. And we develop ads that specialize in each of those categories. So one of the main mistakes that I see marketers make is that they do very general ads. And what a general ad may look like is something like, hire us to fix your closet. Cool, you know, like how does that relate to me? But if you see a picture of a super messy closet and it, um, the ad copy says something like, do you stress out every morning trying to find clothes when you wake up? Or I'm coming up with these off the top of my head or something along the lines of, if you feel like your life is an unorganized mess, maybe you need a new custom closet for an affordable price. That might scream to you. You'd be like, oh my gosh, yes, my closet is that messy and it does take me an hour to find clothes in the morning just to get ready. And that's where I would say specialize and find your niche. So that's step number one is figuring out what they specialize in. Then we develop solution-based ads to you know, scream at the person looking at them. When a customer looks at your ad, you want it to scream at them and be like, that's me. We also only use messenger-based ads. I hate lead forms. I will never use a lead form, no matter how much a customer will beg me to do it. And I say that because in their own best interest, we've seen a shift of not only are lead forms much more expensive, but people don't always want to fill out a lead form, so they'll put fake information in. So then you're back to square one of who are they? So we only use messenger-based ads, and in doing that, we develop salespeople that focus directly on that specific brand to learn and work with the franchisee or work with the franchise development person to know and understand their business to where they're comfortable with booking appointments or scheduling a consultation or whatever the um, franchisee or franchisor might need. So if you don't use lead forms, filling in your first name, last name, address, uh, how much money you make, whatever, <laughs> telephone number, particularly email address, if you're not using forms to collect that, and that's what the franchisee wants because they, they want a lead that they can contact somehow, then how do you get that information? You get that by actually answering what the customer wants. So if you focus on what the customer wants, AKA their questions or what their you know immediate responses to your ad, they will be more than happy to give you that information. And that's how I explain it to each of the owners that I work with. I'm, you know, you may think you need that upfront information right there, but you actually develop a more personal relationship with your customer or with your franchisees whenever you have a real conversation with them, whether it be on Messenger or on the phone, they are willing to give you that information once you answered their questions, more so than on a lead form. Yeah. And then, so what does it cost one of your clients to, to engage with you? 
It really depends on how much they're wanting to spend on advertising. I always suggest at least doing $1,500 a month of pure advertising spend. My agency, uh, depending on the client, will cost anywhere from $800 to $1,000 as just a retainer fee. But, you know, something unique about FlickSwitch that doesn't fall into the category of, you know, every other marketing agency is that most marketing agencies pull a percentage of your budget to therefore keep for themselves. FlickSwitch, we're flat rate, kind of like a royalty, we're flat rate, instead of taking that percentage because I actually encourage people to increase their Facebook budgets and I don't want them to think I'm encouraging them to increase their Facebook budget just for me to get more money. I encourage them to do it because it gets them more business. And you're going to be a keynoter at the Selling Franchises Boot Camp at Palm Beach Atlantic University. This is a boot camp that we sponsor every year. Franchise professionals from across the country uh, attend this program, and uh, they're going to look forward to what you have to explain to them. What are you going to teach at that boot camp? Main thing I want to teach is to be real and be human. Um, I think franchise development has is so far behind in their ways of marketing. What we're doing with Home Run is going to surpass them if they don't catch up type of deal. If you're relying on leads to come in or phone calls to come in or you're waiting on paid search ads to kick, I would say you're going to be left in the dust. So I would say I'm going to give the people who listen to the keynote the recipe of not only conversational marketing, but the recipe on how to close deals and ensure that you have happy customers, happy leads per se, and really just how to get them through the whole process. And how to do that without using a lead form. And how to do it without using a lead form, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know people are going to look forward to that. What is conversational marketing? Is that who's using it? Who should be using it? Conversational marketing is marketing that drives real interactions between real humans and customers to answer questions that a lead will have in order to close a deal. Conversational marketing could look like your Facebook ads. It could even go onto your website. Um, but the main focus I like to have on conversational marketing is being real, being human, having real human interaction and not using chatbots for se. Okay. That is technically conversational marketing, but I think uh, people can tell when you're using a chatbot because it sounds like a robot. Um, so conversational marketing is real human interactions. So people use the robots or chatbots because they're less expensive than what you've been emphasizing, mm -hmm. real humans interacting with uh, people. So does that get in the way of people being able to use your service because it's going to be more expensive or how do you balance that out? Maybe it's more effective than, definitely it'd be more effective than robots. Nobody uh, likes dealing with these chats yeah. uh, when you know, uh, you know they're giving you option. If you wanna know about this, is that what you wanna know about? Well then click here. No, it's not what I wanna know about, but I'm trying to explain it in a way that you're not getting. It's very frustrating for the consumer. Exactly. And you know, I would, I would actually say I've never had an issue as far as cost goes. Um, whenever explaining my, my business and, you know, even the conversational marketers I have, or AKA the, the non chatbots, the real people. And I don't think I've ever had an issue with um, somebody having the cost because they see the value of having a real human being. Because, you know, if you had your automated chatbot it might be a little less expensive, although chatbots are getting pricey these days. But the chatbot won't communicate directly with the franchisee to get specific answers to questions. Uh, they also, the chatbot wouldn't be able to actually book the appointment for the owners. And also chatbots mess up. I mean, humans mess up too. But yeah. if you see a chatbot send the same message 10 times, you're like, oh, I'm definitely talking to a robot. Whereas a human may misspell something, but then you just send the correct version in the next message. So, I, you know, I really haven't had any pushback on my pricing, which, you know, feels good. Maybe I need to raise it as a business owner, yeah. but um, um, no, I mean, everyone seems to really love it and enjoy the people I have that work for me and I get nothing but compliments on them. And a lot of times, you know, people start new businesses and be like, can I hire her to be my personal assistant? I'm like, no. <laughs> um, right. So I, I've never had the pushback right. well, on that's costs. Great and, information. You know, uh, that's great information that you've provided. You're the 
poster child for the Gen Zs who should be getting involved in franchising. And, and more and more young people are. Uh, and I can attest to that from what I do every day at the Titus Center. So mm -hmm. I, I wish you uh, continued success, not only in your business, but in, in attracting more millennials and Gen Zs into franchising. It certainly is the future for so many people. It's difficult today to find a satisfying job, even though there's so many jobs, but to find that job that you really click with and then a job that's going to compensate you at a level where you can actually build wealth and afford yes. to buy a home, getting more and more uh, difficult. Uh, the, the path to that success, uh, not only in America, but other parts of the world, is franchising if you get exposed to it and if you understand how to get into it. So I wish you a lot of success in that. Congratulate you for what you're doing and give my regards to your father. I look forward to seeing both of you at the Selling Franchises Bootcamp. We're very excited to go. Thank you, Kayla. Thanks for tuning in to the Franchise Hot Seat Podcast with Dr. John P. Hayes. Tune in next time for more conversation around all things franchising.